A very warm welcome to today's class. Today we will discuss something related to reproductive health. Ami mane last class re reproductive health discussion kori thile. So what were the different type of contraceptives we have read, and we have also studied about what were the difficulties that were there uh, that we face in case of maintaining a good reproductive health in the society. So everything which is in excess is a problem. and if it gets to a minimum that is also a problem so in nature everything has to be maintained in a balanced way for example if you see the simple example of water cycle if you have rains for a prolonged time it leads to flood and if there is no rain it leads to drought conditions so similarly whenever we talk of any aspect of life there has to be a balance So today we will discuss a very interesting topic, which is infertility. And why is it important? In our last class, we have read about reproductive health and how to control population explosion. So one aspect of reproductive health was to decrease population explosion, or to maintain a, a constant population. And the other aspect is if we do not have fertile individuals then the rate of uh, the birth rate might go down so that will also lead to a different kind of imbalance which is your infertility how do we define infertility then infertility can be defined as the failure to conceive within one or more years of uninterrupted coitus in case of normal couples who are in their fertile period if they fail to conceive within a year of uninterrupted unprotected sexual intercourse we say that they are infertile so now how do we categorize infertility we can categorize infertility into two broad categories one is primary infertility and the other is secondary infertility now what do we mean by primary and secondary infertility if there is a fertile couple they already have a child and they cannot produce subsequent children in that case we say it is a case of secondary infertility because they already had bear a child but further subsequent addition of population was not possible then what about primary infertility it is that infertility when the couple have no child at all or they have never had any issues so this is all about my primary fertility and secondary fertility so now let's come to the causes that are responsible for infertility primary and secondary infertility and now the causes that are associated with it we have biparental sex or biparental condition in case of sexual reproduction that is human beings so two parents are involved a mother and a father so infertility can be accounted to both the mother and the father so the female we can say the female factors can contribute to 30% the male factors can contribute to 30% combined male and female factors can contribute to 30% and idiopathic causes can contribute to the rest of 10% so we get it completely these are the causes so we cannot just blame the mother or the father exclusively for the case of infertility now let's see what are the different factors associated with female infertility and those that are associated with male infertility before going to the factors let's discuss the risk factors of infertility why at all does infertility Uh, aggravate or what are the factors that lead to infertility as you can see in the slide 
we have the first and most important thing that is mental stress. If a couple is mentally stressed, they cannot bear a child by normal coitus. It will inhibit the normal production of children. And so, in today's world of stress, when everyone is in a rat race, this is the most important risk factor for infertility. Stress can never lead to a fertile outcome from a couple. Next is the age. Now that the civilization has uh, gone apart and uh, now we are in a industrialized state of society, we have much work to do. So, the age of, of marriage has also gone up both in case of male and females and with increasing age, the risk of infertility increases because you all must be knowing that within a, a limited lifespan, a female can just uh, ovulate or it can just produce 400 to 500 viable eggs and with age, this number of follicles will decrease. And next most important thing is eating habits and lifestyle. So, we are living in a modern society with all wrong eating habits and a very sedentary lifestyle. Why do I say wrong eating habits? Because teen, teenagers these days, they prefer mostly the junk food and these food are a major cause of infertility. So, wrong eating habits and a sedentary lifestyle can also lead to infertility. Coming to the next point, smoking, alcohol and drug abuse. These three factors can also trigger infertility. And as I have already told you, sedentary lifestyle which leads to a isolation state of mind and we can say there is less of interaction socially among friends or peer groups and this particular mental state again leads to some risk factors for fertility. And as we have already discussed in our last classes, sexually transmitted diseases can also hamper the normal process of fertilization. One more important thing is obesity and overweight condition. As we consume a lot of junk food and as our food that we take is not that rich in dietary, fib dietary fibers, overweight or obesity is a very normal condition these days. So, this also adds to infertility. One more thing, we always ignore over exercise. We think that the more, the, the more we exercise, the more it is helpful for us. But as I told you, everything in our excess is deleterious. So, exercise up to a certain limit is always advisable. Beyond that limit, it may be a factor for infertility in case of women. And finally, chemical exposure. Those who are uh, always in a exposed condition to radiations, be it in medical professions, be it in research, be it in lab, be it in industries, they all are also at a risk of infertility. So, these are some of the factors. There are lot more factors, but due to time constraint, we have just short listed a few important ones. Now, let us come to the female factors. When we say female factors, we have already discussed reproductive system. We know about all the reproductive structures in male and female system of man. So, in female, whatever organs are there for reproduction, all those are involved under these factors. So, we can categorize the female factors under five broad categories and this will be based on the hormonal regulation of ovarian and uterine uh, cycles and their anatomical and functional activities of the organs that are involved. We have the hypothalamus, pituitary, gonadal axis. From our previous classes, we have dealt with it. They will secrete LH and or they will stimulate the secretion of LH and FSH from the pituitary via the hypothalamus and this will directly affect your ovaries. In ovaries, FSH 
will stimulate follicular growth, stimulate the follicular growth and luteinizing hormone will help in ovulation. So, from our previous knowledge, we know that these two hormones play an important role in the female reproductive system. And once successfully a uh, egg has been ovulated or ovulation has taken place, it will lead to implantation. Where will the implantation occur? In the endometrium and the baby will be formed. So, in this process, whatever hormones are involved and whatever organs are involved, starting from pituitary to the ovaries, to the fallopian tubes and the uterus, cervix as well as vagina, they all will play an important role in the female factors. Any kind of disorder or any kind of disorientation in all these factors will lead to female infertility. So, what are the five major categories that we have listed out? In the slide you can see we have pituitary disorders, we have ovarian disorders, we have ovulation disorders, we have pelvic, tubal and uterine disorders and the last unexplained or idiopathic disorder. Now, let us discuss all of these in details. Coming to pituitary disorder, as I have already told you pituitary will release FSH and LH under the influence of gonadotrophin releasing hormones. Either the hypoactivity or the hyperactivity, I have already told the balance is always maintained. So, if these hormones are either hyperactivated or hypoactivated, it will lead to a diseased condition which will further lead to infertility. What will happen if it is hypoactivated? Hypo means the levels of hormones will go down, so it might lead to ovulation disorders. What if it is hyperactive? If these hormones are hyperactive and there are no sufficient follicles to be stimulated, it might lead to ovarian failure. What are these? We will discuss in details. One more hormone that is released is prolactin. Now, if this prolactin increases, the condition it is called as hyperprolactonemia. And in hyperprolactonemia, what happens? It will negatively stimulate your gonadotrophin releasing hormones. And once it is negatively stimulated, the FSH and LH levels will go down. And so, this will also lead to a ovulation disorder. Again, coming to hyperthyroidism. Hyperthyroidism is a condition which will induce prolactonemia or which will induce further lead to hyperprolactonemia. So, all these in total or taken together, they will account for the pituitary disorders of infertility. Next, coming to the ovarian disorders. In the ovary, we have a condition, a diseased condition called as PCOD which is polycystic ovarian disorder. There are multiple cysts over the ovary as you can see in the diagram and this also leads to infertility. It might also account for premature ovarian failure. So, premature fa uh, ovarian failure means there will be either the cessation of menstrual cycle. Menstrual cycle usually takes place or usually continues in a normal female up to 45 to 50 years, but if it ceases before 40 years, we say it is a premature ovarian failure condition. Same with the condition if there is a depletion of follicles. If there are no healthy follicles, we also say that it is premature ovarian failure and these premature ovarian failures can be due to many reasons, chemotherapy or you can say uh, exposure to various kind of toxins or uh, maybe due to certain immune disorders. So, all these factors can trigger up the premature ovarian failure. So, PCOD and premature ovarian failure are very deleterious for your fertile condition. 
and last but not the least in ovarian factors we can discuss luteal phage. We say that your entire menstrual cycle is divided into follicular phage and luteal phage. So, in the luteal phage what will happen? Corpus luteum will secrete progesterone to maintain pregnancy. But if we have a disoriented or abnormal corpus luteum, it will not sustain pregnancy. So, these are some of the factors that will lead to infertility and these we can contribute it to the ovary. pituitary ovary disorders. Now, the third point is ovulation disorder. Under ovulation disorder, we have three different categories type 1, type 2, type 3. Our ovulation disorder is FSH LH level. It will hinder the normal process of ovulation. And it may be due to many reasons like your PCOD or it may be due to hypergonadotrophism or hypogonadotrophism. Jekonosi condition will be ovulation disorder might result. Now, coming to the fourth point that is your pelvic, tubal and uterine disorder. Any damage to any of these parts can lead to infertility uh, and uh, this might be a cause for ectopic pregnancy which may be due to STD. Last class we have discussed ectopic pregnancy can result due to STD or due to more use of intrauterine devices. Endometriosis is yet another cause for infertility in which the endometrial lining proliferation takes place and this rapid proliferation leads to the deposition of endometrial tissue outside the uterine cavity. In some cases, tubal factors might also lead to infertility and tubal factors include endometriosis, pelvic inflammation disorders and it also may be due to sexually transmitted diseases. And uh, these tubal uh, disorders are mostly because of the change in the cervical mucus um, concentration we can say that it will not allow the, the sperm to enter into the uterine tract. Now coming to the uterus, the disorders in uterus account for mostly 10 percent of the cases. It might be due to uterine fibroids or it might be due to Mullerian anomalies. We knew about two different ducts, Ulfian duct and Mullerian duct and Mullerian duct is responsible for the formation of all the reproductive parts in female. So, any anomaly in the Mullerian duct might also be a factor for infertility like the shape of the uterus or the numbers of fallopian tubes might be increased or decreased, structure of the uterus might be disoriented, there might be septate uterus and many such conditions accounting for Mullerian anomalies. Next, these are in the slide you can see these are some common terms associated with sperms. We have completed the uh, female factors and sorry, the female factors also include one more factor that is the idiopathic causes. As I have already told you, it is responsible for both in male and female cases. So, idiopathic means we do not know about the real cause of idiopathic factors. Now, in the slide you can see these are some common terms that we always come across in any kind of competitive examinations. Aspermia. Aspermia means failure of ejaculation of semen and oligospermia means the sperm count is less than the normal which is less than 20 million per ml. What is polygospermia? The count is more than 350 million per ml and agospermia means no sperm in the semen. Asthenogospermia means reduced sperm motility. So, the number of sperms traveling to the fallopian tubes will decrease. Necrogospermia means spermatozoa are dead or they are motionless and teratogospermia means there are anatomical abnormalities in around 70 percent of the sperms that are or spermatozoa that are discharged. Now, quickly coming to the male factors of infertility. In case of male, we can categorize them under three broad headings that is pre-testicular, post-testicular and testicular factors. In pre-testicular, we can uh, subhead, we can put them under, categorize them under two different subheadings that is your endocrine disorders and coital disorders. In coital disorders, we can say ejectile or erectile dysfunction 
and ejaculatory failure are two major causes for infertility. In post testicular, testicles do you understand? Testicles means testis. So, pre testicular means before the testis that is your neural uh, reflexes and the hormonal signals that will come. Testicular means spermatogenesis and post testicular means anything that relates to transfer of the sperm from the seminiferous tubule towards the penis. So, post testicular might include obstructive uh, disorders that is your either obstruction in the epididymis or obstructive in the ductal system. It might be due to epididymal hostility and it might be due to accessory gland infections also. Coming to testicular factors, testicular factors we can again categorize them into genetic factors and non-genetic factors. Under genetic factors comes Klinefelter syndromes and Y chromosome deletions and under non-genetic fa non factors we can say the numerous factors will come like infection, like congenital bath defects, like your anti-spermatogenic agents, like immunological uh, suppressive reagents they might also lead to infertility and last but not the least idiopathic causes as in case of females also we do not know the real cause behind the idiopathic causes. Now coming to the diagnosis for infertility. Now that we know that these are the factors for male infertility and these are the factors for female infertility. Now how do we go about diagnosing these factors? We uh, refer some tests for this particular cause and in the slide you can see there are certain tests for male and some for female. In case of male we advise or it is advised for physical examination of the male semen analysis normal constituent our concentration of the semen its color order pH everything has to be normal then the analysis of blood for the level of hormones in it ultrasound that will tell us about any kind of we can say anatomical disorientations either in the ductal system or in your testicular part and STD or the chlamydia test. Chlamydia test is it will confirm if there is a sexually transmitted disease or not and for that antibiotics are to be taken. Similarly, if in case of female certain tests are advised that is first and foremost is physical examination a gynecologist will go for this and will see that all the physical aspects are functional. Then the blood test again for the level of hormones in it pelvic ultrasound to see that your uterine cavity, cervix, fallopian tubes are in normal state and we have ovary and reserve testing and thyroid function testing also. So, these are the different diagnosis for infertility. Now, that diagnosis is over, we will go to the treatment part. What are the treatment options for infertile couples for male and female? Again, this treatment will differ from person to person because of difference in age, their social status, their economic conditions, their food habits, everything will have a different, uh, you can say a different uh, consequence for different individuals. So, the treatment option will vary from individual to individual and therefore, it is advised always to go to a medical practitioner. And in case of male all the functions, all the erectile disorders or about the sperm concentrations that we have dealt with or about um, we can say ejaculation uh, disorders, everything they have to be discussed with the physician and proper medications are to be taken. Some healthy living habits like administration of vitamins, good eating habits, ample amount of exercise can also lead to better sperm production or lead to improved fertility condition in case of male. For females in a similar way we can say for ovulation disorders drugs and hormones can be given and for fallopian tube uh, anomalies if at all there is any kind of fallopian tube disorientations or damages that can be dealt with surgically and laparoscopic surgeries can also be produced uh, can also be practiced for conditions like endometriosis. So, these are the treatment options for infertility. Now that we have discussed about all the factors, what are the risks for infertility, what are the different 
uh, treatment options and how we can go about having a fertile life period. I hope you all have clearly understood this topic and in order to have a better understanding, please go through some good textbooks to increase your knowledge. Welcome students, today we will see a very interesting chapter, a very interesting part of your reproductive health which is your amniocentesis and we will also deal with assisted reproductive technologies. Now, why do I say these are very interesting? Because these are certain techniques that can tell us before the birth of the child about its health or in case of reproductive failure, these are the techniques, there are some techniques that will help us in creating a new life in vitro. So, let us start with amniocentesis. Now, this is a invasive procedure. Let me tell you, it is a medical procedure and mostly it is done for prenatal diagnosis of certain conditions of the fetus. As you can see in this slide, fetal infection, chromosomal abnormalities or we can also determine the sex of the child by this procedure. A small amount of amniotic fluid is aspirated by the help of a long needle and it is the fluid is used for chromosomal analysis as well as to study any kind of abnormal metabolites if they are present in that particular fluid. Now, what is amniocentesis? It is a procedure which is usually performed in the third trimester of pregnancy. It might also be performed in the second trimester and this is a procedure that will detect chromosomal abnormalities in fetus. Usually when a woman is between 14 to 16 weeks pregnant, this procedure is carried out. And during this procedure what is done? A sample of amniotic fluid is taken from the amniotic sac. I hope you all must remember what is amniotic sac and what is amniotic fluid from our previous, cl previous classes. Now, the amniotic fluid which is around the baby or which is or the fluid in which the baby baths, this particular fluid contains some cells that are uh, we can say that are uh, given out by the body of the baby. So, these dead cells flow or uh, float in the amniotic fluid as well as some excretory metabolic waste are also diffused into this particular amniotic fluid. Now, this amniotic fluid which contains the skin of the develop developing baby and its metabolic waste, it can be collected by this procedure and we can analyze this fluid for the genetic information regarding the baby. Like we can analyze or we can help the doctor by uh, providing this fluid so that they will access the fetus health and detect if there is any potential problem or abnormalities in the fetal condition. Now, coming to the next slide, what are the reasons for amniocentesis? As you can see in the slide, I have categorized it under two broad headings. What is the need during the second trimester and what is the need during the third trimester? We have already discussed about the three trimesters of pregnancy in our previous classes. So, during the second trimester, the reasons are as follows. If the mother is of 35 years or older, if the previous pregnancy was detected with some kind of birth defects or if there is some anomaly in the blood test or in the ultrasound that is suggestive of the upcoming birth defect or also if there is a family history of genetic disorder, then also we go for amniocentesis in the second trimester. And what happens during the third trimester? During the third, third trimester, it is mostly carried out to determine the maturity of baby's lungs, if the lungs are fully functional or not, so that we will be sure that after birth, the baby does not face any problem because it will come out from a fluid medium to the external terrestrial medium. Now, what are the other reasons? The other reasons are if we have to diagnose certain kind of infection or if we are suspicious of any kind of infection, 
we can also do this amniocentesis during the third trimester and we can also check for anemia in the babies with RH incompatibility. Coming to the next slide, the amniocentesis uh, we cannot be sure that it will deal or it will detect all birth defects, but this procedure can be used to detect certain conditions if the parents have significant genetic risk. What are the significant genetic risk of the parents? If the parents had Down syndrome, sickle cell uh, diseases, cystic fibrosis, muscular dystrophy and similar cases, in that cases amniocentesis can be helpful. It can detect certain neural tube defects of the fetus also like spina bifida and encephaly. So, this will be very helpful for us in knowing that the child is properly developing, there is no neural anomaly or there are no chromosomal abnormalities in the child. So, what are the things that can be detected within the fetus? What are the chromosomal anomalies that we can detect through this process? We can detect trisomy conditions, trisomy of the 21st, 18th and 13th chromosome as well as we can also determine the sex of the baby. And because the ultrasound is performed, it is an ultrasound guided procedure, it is not a blind procedure because it is an invasive procedure, we need an ultrasound transducer to exactly locate the position of the amniotic sac so that it does not hamper the baby. And so, because we are using an ultrasound uh, uh, medium, ultrasound is performed, it may detect certain birth defects that are not detected easily, such as your cleft palate or heart disorders or uh, we can say uh, clubbed foots. So, through this ultrasound, we can find out all these problems are there or not and through amniocentesis, we can find out if there are chromosomal abnormalities or not. Now, coming to the procedure, it is an OPD procedure and we do not require any admission in this case. If a person wants to go for amniocentesis, he um, uh, sorry, she need not be admitted, it can be done on a outpatient procedure. So, what is done? First, all the instruments that are, be, that are to be used are sterilized and a local anesthesia is applied on the abdominal area where the needle is to be inserted. Here, uh, I have kept a diagram for you. You can see it is guided by ultrasound and a needle is pierced through the abdomen into the amniotic sac without affecting the baby. And thereafter, using this particular needle, a small amount of amniotic fluid is withdrawn. This amniotic fluid is further analyzed for chromosomal anomalies and it can also be cryopreserved for further use. What are the precautions that are taken after the procedure is over? After the procedure is over, the doctor will see that the fetal heartbeat is regular or normal. Ultrasound wise, he will confirm that the fetal heartbeat is normal and he will also see that there is no abdominal hemorrhage or abdominal bleeding from the side from where the needle was inserted. And with a uh, few minutes of rest, the mother can go back and uh, she might also have some mild cramps and lower abdominal pain due to this procedure. So, now coming to this diagram, in the slide you can see in the left we have a diagram of amniocentesis and on the right you have chorionic villus sampling. In both the cases, these are used for detecting chromosomal abnormalities. The difference being in amniocentesis, we directly take out the fluid or the amniotic fluid and in case of chorionic villus sampling, using a catheter, the chorionic villi tissue is extracted and this is mostly in the early part of the pregnancy. So, this is the procedure, entire procedure of amniocentesis that we have already discussed and future applications are it helps in regenerative cell therapy that is the amniotic fluid contains those uh, cells, amniotic cells and these cells have pluripotency which can act as in future if that person loses a particular organ, it can be regenerated from those cells and so that there will be no donor recipient conflict and the person can 
safely have his own tissue back. So, this is the best application or the future application and these are some of the drawbacks which is which are the uterine infection. These drawbacks are uterine infection of the mother, miscarriages in some rare cases, vaginal bleeding, certain infectious diseases might be transmitted, some allergic reactions if the fetal blood mixes with the maternal blood and some danger in case of RH incompatibility cases. Now let us see what are assisted reproductive technologies and how are they useful. Why do we need assisted reproductive technology? We have dealt with infertility. So, if nothing works, if none of the medications work in order to gain fertility, ultimately the couples go for assisted reproductive technology. That is the technology that will help them to bear a child. So, what is it by definition we can say that all procedures that involves manipulation of the gametes and embryos outside the body for the treatment of infertility can be called as assisted reproductive technologies. Some of the uh, uh, technologies under this heading are listed in the slide as you can see IVF which is in vitro fertilization and embryo transfer. GIFT which is gamete intrafallopian transfer, ZIFT zygote intrafallopian transfer, ICSI, POST and SUZI which is subzonal insemination and in your syllabus you have IVF, GIFT and ZIFT. These three we will be discussing in details. Now let us see what are the steps in assisted reproductive technology. The first step being down regulation of your normal menstrual cycle. Because if we do not down regulate the normal cycle, we cannot play with the hormones, we cannot make our own hormonal changes. And the second part is controlled ovarian hyperstimulation. Third step is monitoring the follicular growth in the ovary, then after that oocyte retrieval, after the follicles grow, it matches, we will retrieve the oocyte and then we will fertilize this particular oocyte in vitro or in lab conditions by the methods of IVF, ICSI or GIFT. And thereafter transfer of the gametes or embryos into the abdominal cavity and then luteal support along with progesterone to maintain the pregnancy. So, these are some of the basic steps of assisted reproductive technology and we have already dealt with some of it in the reproductive chapter, reproductive system chapter. Now, let us come to in vitro fertilization in details. Now, in the picture you can see in the slide you can see the first in vitro fertilization was successful in 1978 and the baby was born. The first picture shows the creators with the baby. They are Patrick Steptoe and Robert Edwards and recently Robert Edwards was awarded Nobel Prize in Medicine in 2010 for this particular technology and that particular baby in the picture has grown up to this fine lady you can see in the diagram she is Louis Brown who is the first successful IVF baby. And coming to the Indian scenario Dr. Subhas Mukhopadhyay of Kolkata was the one who created the first child using this particular in vitro fertilization process in India and the name was Durga who was born. 67 days after the first baby was born in United Kingdoms by in vitro fertilization. Now, what are the indications for IVF? When do we go for this particular procedure? The indications are if there are certain tubal disorders or endometriosis as we have already discussed or in case of unexplained infertility uh, that is everything is normal, but still the couple are not able to conceive, the female is not able to conceive. Next uh, we can say cervical hostility that is the cervix is hostile to the incoming sperms, ovarian failure that is cessation of menstrual cycle we have already discussed, normal ovaries but no functional uterus. So, there will be egg will be produced, but due to the lack of a uh, uh, functional uterus it will not be implanted and failed 
ovulation induction. If there will be no ovulation, eggs will not be released and male infertility factors are also an indication for going for this particular procedure. Now that we have seen the factors associated, let us discuss the procedure in details. If IVF comes as a long question, we can include all these steps. The steps are first we have to suppress the natural hormonal cycle, then we have to have a controlled ovarian stimulation, third is oocyte retrieval, fourth is fertilization in vitro and the embryonic development in the lab condition itself. Then finally, we have to transfer this developed embryo into the uterine cavity and provide it with a luteal support, a luteal feed support that is the progesterone support to maintain the pregnancy. Here in this slide, you can see the diagram of the entire process. The uh, oocytes are retrieved, they are cultured in our lab and the semen is prepared, embryonic development takes place and intrauterine transfer of the embryo is achieved in the final step. We will discuss all this in details. Coming to the first part, suppression of natural hormonal cycle is essential because if the natural ovulation will occur, then there will be no eggs and eggs will not leave the ovary. So, doctors will not be able to collect mature eggs from the female. So, we need to suppress natural hormonal cycle. Next coming to the ovarian stimulation, we, knew, we need numerous healthy viable ovum to be produced. So, for this we need to produce multiple mature follicles rather than a single one which is developed in the normal cases. So, for this we need to provide ovarian hormone stimulation. Third part being the oocyte maturation which is performed generally by an injection of human chorionic gonadotropin and this is commonly called as the trigger shot. The egg retrieval is performed usually at a time between 34 to 36 hours after the HCG injection has been given. The egg is retrieved usually accomplished by a transvaginal ultrasound aspiration. It is done under certain general anesthetic uh, uh, procedure, it is a, it's a uh, invasive procedure and about 20 to 30 minutes are taken for this particular procedure. In some circumstances, we can see that one or both the ovaries may not be ac accessible by this transvaginal ultrasound that you are seeing in this diagram. The laparoscopy may then be used to retrieve these eggs using a small telescope that is placed in the umbilicus. Next, we will collect the oocytes. The eggs are aspirated from the follicles through the needle that is connected to a suction device. Usually around 10 to 15 oocytes are aspirated, the eggs are prepared and they are cleared off from the surrounding cells. After the eggs are retrieved, they are examined in the laboratory for maturity and quality and only the good ones are placed in an IVF culture medium and then they are transferred to an incubator where they will be fertilized by the sperms. Where from the sperms will come? Shortly before or after the oocyte collection, the male partner will be asked to give the sperm sample. These are collected about 60 to 90 minutes prior to fertilization. They are liquefied, centrifu centrifuged and suspended in a culture medium and they are incubated for 30 to 60 minutes at 37 degrees centigrade. The most active sperms are located in the surface of the medium and the sperms may be obtained either from the testicles, the epididymis or vast difference from men whose semen is devoid of sperms. Either it may be due to lack of uh, production or it may be due to obstruction in the duct systems. Now, the fertilization is started by adding ample amount of motile sperms to the culture medium in which the oocytes are incubated. A procedure which is called as ICSI or intracytoplasmic sperm injection is indicated in cases where the semen fluid does not contain sperm. In this process what happens? The embryologist will isolate a sperm cell, draw it up into a microscopic needle and inject it directly into the oocyte using a high power microscope. The pipette is manipulated to pierce the oocyte 
and the sperm is injected into the cytoplasm that is why we say it is intracytoplasmic sperm injection. And um, uh, as you can see in this particular diagram, the uh, oocyte is held with a particular object and then the needle is inserted in order to uh, put the sperm into the cytoplasmic area. The fertilization check is performed on the next day approximately 18 hours after the sperm injection and usually 65 to 75 percent of the mature eggs will fertilize. Then they are cultured in special incubators to support the division and development. If the couple has a history of certain genetic disorder that gene uh, and the gene that is causing that problem is identified then a pre-implantation genetic diagnosis is done. So, this is done prior to fertilization. The development of the egg will take place and then the developed embryo or at the mostly at the blastocyst stage it will be transferred uh, into the uterine cavity with a uh, which is already suspended in your culture medium and it will be transferred with the help of a transfer catheter which is a long thin sterile tube with a syringe on one end. The physician will generally guide the tip of the transfer catheter through the cervix and it will and he will place the fluid containing the embryos into the uterine cavity and this is how the embryo transfer will be done. Now how many uh, oocytes or how sorry how many embryos are to be transferred? How will we decide out of that culture of embryos how many are to be transferred into the uterine cavity? This again depends on the age and the embryo quality of that particular individual case. If the age is less than 35 years of the mother, then normally two embryos are transplanted. If it is from 35 to 37, 2 to 3. If it is from 38 to 40 years of age, 3 to 4 are inserted. And for people with more than 40 years of age, nearly 5 embryos are transferred into the uterine cavity. For patients who have already failed IVF cycles or a poor prognosis, in those cases the numbers may I, might either be increased or decreased upon the uh, advice of the doctor as well as the embryologist. Now this is all about your intra or in vitro fertilization. What happens if the embryo is properly implanted within the uterine cavity there will be successful pregnancy and after that the luteal phage support is provided where what is done we give function of corpus luteum in normal cycle is to produce progesterone that will maintain the pregnancy similarly in case of IVF or in vitro fertilization also after the embryo has been successfully transplanted into the uterine cavity after implantation has been guaranteed the pregnancy is maintained by a dose of progesterone for a period of time and this is called as your luteal phage support. So, these are the basic steps of in vitro fertilization and it is one of the best assisted reproductive technologies so far as statistics proves that if it is carried out in a proper place under proper guidance and un under proper physiological conditions saying uh, that the age of the mother is below 35 and the mother is healthy and if everything goes well the success rates are quite high. Now coming to two other procedures which are your gamete intrafallopian transfer and ZIFT or zygote intrafallopian transfer. What happens in case of gamete intrafallopian transfer? It is much similar to your IVF but here the gametes are transferred to the woman's fallopian tubes rather than her uterus. What is done in IVF? The gametes are uh, fertilized outside and the embryo is transplanted into the uterine cavity but, but here the gametes are transferred into the fallopian tube, intra fallopian transfer. So, the gametes will be transferred into the fallopian tubes rather than her uterus and the fertilization will take place in the uterus rather than in laboratory conditions as compared to your in vitro fertilization. Similarly, what happens in case of zygote intra fallopian transfer? 
This technique differs from your gamut intrafallopian transfer in that the fertilization will take place in the lab conditions. Okay. The fertilization will fertil only the fertilization part will take place in the lab in culture dishes and after fertilization what do we get? We get a zygote. This zygote will be transferred to the tube rather than the uterus. So, in case of IVF, GIFT and ZIFT the basic difference lies is in IVF in vitro fertilization is done. Fertilization takes place in lab, embryo is developed and then it is implanted. In GIFT the gametes are transferred and in ZIFT the fertilized zygote is transferred to the tube. So, these two are intrafallopian transfer, but in case of IVF the fertilized or the developing embryo is transferred directly into the uterine cavity. Now that we have discussed IVF in details and the associated reproductive technology, let us see what are the disadvantages of this in vitro fertilization. As you can see in the slide, the disadvantages include multiple pregnancies as number of embryos are transferred, so it might lead to multiple pregnancy, increased risk, risk of ectopic pregnancy, it might also result in ovary and hyperstimulation syndrome in women who already have PCOS and it might lead to hemorrhage and pelvic inf infection during the transvaginal ultrasound guided egg retrieval process. It might lead to miscarriages or preterm infants. It also might lead to stress and anxiety in the mother and last but not the least, it might be a costly and painful affair too. So, this completes our reproductive health. I hope you have clearly understood all these parts of assisted reproductive technology and I hope it has given a new hope to all the infertile couples world, worldwide to have a fertile life period and to have a baby successfully. Thank you.